Hi, everyone. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. People are still signing up. I'm really happy you could join us. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NAA's monthly webinar series. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of NAAE, and I'm so thrilled that all of you could join us. And today we are focusing on the connection between environmental education and the next generation science standards, a match made in nature, which was the great title from our guest speaker today, Matt. A number of you have asked for an update about NGSS, and we appreciate all of you who have actually sent in your questions and are wondering what's happening with NGSS, not only in your own state, but across the country and how we as a field can collaborate more. And our guest for today's webinar is Matt Crable, who is a guru of science education, and I'll introduce him in a minute. Um, but he is really helping to create this transformational change in science education. I also want to thank all our affiliate co-hosts who are working with NAA to sponsor our monthly webinar series. And I'm also very excited that we have National Wildlife Federation as another co-sponsor for today's webinar. And I want to thank Kevin Coyle, the Vice President of Education and all our partners at NWF for co-sponsoring this webinar and for all the work that they do all the time on environmental education and conservation and all the work that we're doing together. As many of you know, if you've joined a webinar in the past, we are trying through our monthly webinars to highlight new ideas and thinking in the field, showcase leaders who are doing innovative things and just improve our own knowledge, our own practice and encourage new thinking across a number of different disciplines. So always let us know if you have ideas for speakers and for topics um, that would be of interest to you and your colleagues. And just so you know, we have two great upcoming webinars on May 15th. I'm thrilled that award-winning poet and writing professor, Amy nazuka Gmatatil will be with us. She just published a new set of poetry and we'll talk more about the connection between education, poetry, writing, and nature. And then in June, we hope it's gonna be the last week in June, we're going to do a webinar on bringing research to life and highlight what we're doing on a new research library, EE Works, and a number of other research-related topics. So those are in the future. Um, as many of you know, and but I know that some of you have never been on Zoom, the best way to communicate with us is through the chat room. We have everybody muted because we have so many people online. So you can communicate with us and send a message to the whole group, to one person, to all the panelists, just by using the chat feature. And then we will try to answer as many questions as we can throughout, but whatever we don't get to, we'll post on EE Pro. So, um, and, you know, type your questions away. We'll interrupt here and there, Matt, so he can answer them throughout and at the end. Um, and then just to give you a sense of kind of what you know about NGSS, but more importantly, that you know where the chat feature is, um, we have two uh, trivia questions from Matt. So in the chat box, Tell us, what day were the Next Generation Science Standards officially released? We'll be looking for your answers in the chat. And there will, of course, be a wonderful, wonderful prize, which we will send electronically to you. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, we've got all kinds of, all kinds of dates. I personally would have launched it. Let's see, we still have more coming in. I think it's a pretty good selection from across the four. I personally would have elected um, April 22nd on Earth Day, but it was number three, is that right, Matt? Yes, so for those of you who have number three, we will capture your names and you all win a million dollars. Okay, next question. This is a harder one. 
What are the three dimensions of these standards, of the next generation science standards? Type them in and let's see what you've got. Oh, good. Some of you are using acronyms. You know this stuff. Good going. Look at that, Matt. Okay, we have some NGSS experts online here, which is fantastic. And for those of you who do not know those um, acronyms, you will learn what those acronyms are about through this webinar, but great. Okay, here they are, just written out again. Okay, so you all know where the chat is, ask your questions. Also post any links or make comments as you go, we'll save those as well. Um, if you have any technical problems, again, Kristen is always here, fantastic, helps manage this entire program and is our research guru, along with Max, who is joining us today and our tech guru. So we've got two gurus on board. And now I am so excited to be able to introduce Matt to all of you. Um, and Matt will take control of the screen. Um, but we could not have a better speaker on the next generation science standards. Matt is the Director of Science for ACHIEVE, and he'll tell you more about ACHIEVE in a minute. He has a variety of responsibilities within the science team to further ACHIEVE's efforts to provide support to states and districts in the, excuse me, in the implementation of the next generation science standards. He began his career in science education as a high school science teacher in Kansas, where he taught a wide range of high school science courses over 10 years and his work in the classroom was recognized in 2010 with the Award for Excellence in Conservation and Environmental Education from our Kansas affiliate, the Kansas Association for Environmental Education. Later that year, Matt joined the Kansas State Department of Education as the state science supervisor. And in that role, Matt led Kansas's participation as a lead state in developing the next generation science standards. And he was a lead author of Appendix K model course mapping in middle high school and high school. He also coordinated the statewide effort to use the implementation of these standards as an opportunity to advance science education for all students. And for these efforts to advance science education in Kansas, he was awarded the Kansas Association for Teachers of Science Outstanding Contributions to Science Education Award in 2013 and was selected by Bethel College for their Young Alumnus Award in 2015. In addition to his classroom and state level work, Matt was also working at the national level. While at the Kansas State Department of Education, he served on the board and later as president of the Council of State Science Supervisors. This organization serves to coordinate and support efforts of the state science super supervisors of all states as they work to, together to advance science education. He's also a member of the board on science education for the Natural Resource Council and in that role was on the committee that wrote the guide to implementing the NGSS. So we are so, so excited, Matt, to have you on board. So take it away and we'll give you all a virtual, all of us will give you a virtual welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Um, and thank you to NAAAE and to National Wildlife uh, Foundation Federation for um, sponsoring this and inviting us to be a part of the conversation um, and uh, as, as Judy said, this, we're focusing here on uh, next generation science standards and environmental education. Um, there we go. Sorry, just a little technical difficulty. Um, and as we said, this is, this is a match made in, wait for it, wait. Yeah, we already got this, right? It's nature. Um, and <laughs> certainly the, the intersection of, of what this is, Judy, thank you for the very gracious uh, introduction. Um, and, and Matt, can I interrupt for a second? If you can sure. speak a little louder, that would be fantastic. Absolutely, I can do that. Um, is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, so as Judy mentioned, um, I am the Director of Science at Achieve. Just in case people want my email, there it is. It's mcrable at achieve.org. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Kansas Sci or a, at KS Science Guy or at Kansas Science Guy. And um, I also watch the, I'm not the main person that runs the Twitter account for us at uh, Achieve, but 
uh, I also pay attention to the at official NGSS uh, Twitter handle as well. So I thought the, the best place to get started here was actually to, to, to try to um, uh, tell my own personal EE story in four pictures. So we're gonna do that really quickly and then we'll dig into the standards themselves. Um, there may occasionally be bells in the background because I'm actually working in, the, in a school district right now, helping them to think about uh, selecting uh, instructional materials designed for NGSS. So I apologize for that in the background. Um, so this picture here is uh, about is Kansas farmland, um, pasture land actually. Uh, it's, it's land that belongs to my father-in-law, but both his side of the family and, and my side of the family are all, um, my, all, all four of my grandparents were, were uh, farmers. And uh, that meant something about stewardship for the land, about caring for the land, about paying attention to um, how you care for um, and use the resources of, of, of the land. And that definitely factored into um, my perspective, my life, my, my work. Uh, my parents, of course, both grew up on the farm. Uh, we frequently spent time outside as kids and um, our family vacations during the summers were all about um, hiking and backpacking usually in the mountains of Colorado, but um, lots of time outside, enjoying nature, doing those sorts of things. Um, when I was in college, I had a great opportunity to spend a semester in Costa Rica uh, and really got um, involved in was studying tropical biology the whole time at the University of Costa Rica. I was out in the rainforest and, and um, collecting data and analyzing it and doing all sort of amazing pieces and just really sort of uh, also brought front and center in, with some of the deforestation um, issues that they had or had addressed. Um, what sort of the impacts are of, of the decisions we make uh, on resources. But then when I came back, I actually found that um, I paid better attention to where I was in the environment that I was in currently. So uh, I was living in Northeast Kansas, which is tall grass prairie. And this picture here is actually uh, a, a part of the project that sort of got me recognized um, by the Kansas Association for Conservation and Environmental Education, Casey. And uh, what it was is that I took a big chunk of, a, uh, of our campus at our school and reconstructed it into tall grass prairie. And what you have in this particular picture is uh, on one particular weekend that I may or may not have gotten in trouble for, um, we brought in goats to graze uh, this is a part of the class project in terms of how do we uh, address the issues that we have a lot of bindweed in this area um, that we need to, to adapt. But it was also a part of my transition from one of the things I really liked about um, in high school and in college, I liked telling the story of the cool things that happened in science. And my early years in teaching were all about telling the story and trying to come up with really fascinating, creative ways to tell the story of what science was about and to try to you know, help explain it to other people so they could enjoy it the same way I enjoyed it. And then one of the big things that was a transition for me, and I, I owe part of this to um, my work in environmental science is to shift to, students experiencing that um, and them figuring out the world around them as opposed to me just being uh, compelling and telling them a story about it. Um, and then probably the, the last big shift here, this is um, from the Kansas Prairie Biological Station where I uh, was able to take my students uh, and then they would do field research there and then we'd take it back to the classroom. And this is my daughter running down uh, a pathway that um, my Kansas friends, if they're online, will recognize uh, at the Kansas Prairie Biological Station and, and sort of the impact of, of children in my life. She's now 11, so this is, this is when she was a, a little kiddo, but the impact of children in my life and the impetus to uh, want to think about and take care of the resources uh, of our world. So, um, all of that ended up leading me, as uh, JD said, to um, the State Department of Education and then uh, now working at Achieve. And one of the things I just want to do a quick thing to catch people up on is exactly what is Achieve. As some of you may well know and other ones may not. Um, I knew it very well through my role in helping develop the standards, but um, realized since I got here that a lot of people don't know who Achieve is. 
Um, so Achieve is an education nonprofit that's been over, around a little over 20 years um, working in this space and our website is there achieve.org uh, on a hum whole bunch of different things. Um, policy technical assistance for states, uh, bringing together states experts and partners uh, around policy issues or um, you know, other you know, technical issues that need to be addressed across state lines, um, developing advocacy resources to support those efforts and also conducting research um, to really pay attention across states to what um, states are doing around things like accountability and standards and graduation requirements um, to make sure that uh, that information is easily accessible and, and, and folks can find it. Uh, another piece that of course people are familiar with Achieve for is that we are the group that, um, the organization that coordinated the development of the next generation science standards. Uh, so we worked across with the 26 lead states. I was uh, one of the lead states, so I was a lead state at that point in time. Uh, to develop the standards with all of the state teams. Um, each state team had, um, you know, I'll speak my my space state team in particular, we made sure that we had K-12 educators in the in the room. We had informal science folks. Um, Laura Downey from Casey was in the room with that group. We had uh, folks from uh, our zoos association were a part of that group. We had people from business and industry that were involved in the ground floor of building the standards um, from the very beginning. And, all of the lead states had teams comparable uh, to that uh, in their states working at the, at the very beginning. But Achieve sort of coordinated that role and um, coordinated the work of all these folks work together, but then there was a writing team that um, actually put the words to the pen to the paper and put the words together. Uh, and then the states uh, had many opportunities for feedback in that process. And all of those resources, um, are on a separate web website. So the standards are hosted on nextgenscience.org. So that is a, a website that is managed uh, by Achieve as well. And since the, uh, the standards were finished, they're developed, uh, now work a lot with supporting states and districts and communities in figuring out what it means to uh, move things forward with implementation and we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by implementation over sort of the course of this. Before we get any farther, I'm gonna have um, Kirsten, if you could launch the first poll that has the three questions on it. So I wanna learn a little bit more about you as we, before we sort of get into um, into what's going on here. So I would like you to do two things. If you would answer those three questions in the poll, we'll be able to see that information. And then also, if you get your questions done really quick, we have a lot of folks that are on the call. Uh, I'd love you to put just one sentence in the chat. See if you can summarize your vision for what you want regarding environmental education for all kids by the end of 12th grade. So if you could do that for me uh, in the chat um, and uh, also answer the questions in the poll at the same time, that would be fantastic. And I'm gonna pause for just a little bit for you to be able to do that. And a good comment, somebody mentioned like, those might not be the exact roles that fit um, you or you may have multiple roles. If you can um, specifically select the one that um, matches best or majority of your time, that would be great. Or, you know, if it's close, then um, just uh, pick one.
Okay, so it looks like we have um, a variety of different backgrounds um, and more familiarity with the, the standards than with the framework. With it. So that's good information. And it also looks like um, we have a variety of different roles on the on the phone, professional learning providers. Probably there's some folks that wanted to check that and other things, um, but uh, I'm excited uh, for the folks that are on the line. That's super helpful. Um, we'll, ha we'll, we'll in, a, in a minute or two, we'll have a chance for um, hopping in for some questions, but I wanna get a couple of things here about, just get the status about where things are with the standards. Um, then we'll take a couple of things that are questions if they're related to those things. Um, and then we'll start digging in some details about uh, some of the things and how they're similar and how they're different. But I'm loving um, the uh, visions that folks have for science education uh, for, and for environmental education that are, that are popping through the chat. So thank you for all of those. So um, just a quick update on where we are in terms of NDSS or framework related standards and implementation. Um, I would also say that uh, I should be clear that when I think about implementation, I always think about it as something that never stops, but is an ongoing process where you continually are improving what's happening in your classroom and with your system moving forward. But um, we'll get a couple of things that are sort of some signposts around this. Um, there are 19 states, uh, District of Columbia and the Department of Defense Education Association, so all the Department of Defense schools um, that have adopted the NGSS as they are. They may have added some things beyond, but the, the core of the, the standards, they uh, didn't change at all. Uh, and then there are about 19 states that have adopted something similar uh, to the NGSS with varying degrees, um, but uh, you know, it could be anything from a few words that are changed to um, we have situations where two of the dimensions are more emphasized instead of the third. Um, so there's a pretty wide range of things, um, but you, what you're talking about is, is effectively um, four-fifths of the states and majority of the population that uh, live in places where these are the standards um, at, at the state level. And in addition to that, um, we don't have official numbers from this because sometimes people are doing it um, maybe on the down low a little bit, but um, there are lots of districts, even sizable districts in states that have not adopted standards yet um, since the NGSS were released. And in those places, um, they're actually uh, going forward full steam with implementing the NGSS as well. Before we uh, get into these next phases, um, I would like it if, Kristen, if you could um, put up the other poll and, um, and we'll go ahead and answer those questions um, that maybe have popped up to this point while um, people are responding to the poll. So okay. if, you, if you have a question that came up that you'd like to follow through on. Yeah, Matt, one, one question that came as Nate is developing is part of a grant that's trying to connect classroom teachers to EE providers and wondered if there are any books or resources that would help him with that. So say that again, he wants to connect classroom teachers. Teachers to EE providers. And I'll see if he's got anything else in the chat. Definitely. Great. Go ahead. Did you have something else? No, no, go ahead. Um, so I think the big things here, um, I don't know if I can come up with a specific resource. I do, we'll, we'll touch on one at the end that I think is about the, the guide to implementing that we mentioned earlier, that you mentioned earlier, that was a part of the team that wrote that I think has some resources that connect. Um, and then I think we can actually come up with some additional ones that maybe we can kick into the chat later, but that's a good question. And, and I would say too, that if anybody that is on the chat or is, on the, is listening in has um, additional resources that um, they would recommend for that, they should definitely post them up in the chat. Thanks, Matt. Yep. So the lots, question, go ahead. Lots of really good comments though in all of what people are looking for, like how to differentiate between good science and junk science just all kinds of things that um, our educators are, are 
grappling with. Definitely. So, and, and to the poll question, which I realized I didn't entirely introduce, um, one of these statements comes from uh, the Excellence in Environmental Education Guidelines for Learning that, um, that of course, NAAAE uh, put together. And one of these statements comes from the K-12 Framework for Science Education. So what you're trying to discern here is between which one um, is, is from the framework and which one comes from the Guidelines for Learning. give people uh, another second or two to address that question. Okay, Kristen, I don't know if you could um, post up the results for that poll, that would be great. So it's about 50-50, which is what you might expect because um, as sort of the guiding statements that are uh, from both of these do documents about what we would want kids to be able to do by the end of 12th grade, um, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference, which I think is a really key point of what we're um, gonna be talking about here in a little bit. And we'll do it a little bit into detail uh, about what some additional sim similarities are, but um, I think they, the, the one of the fundamental points I wanted to just drive home there is that, that this is about um, pushing together forward uh, and that our vision for science education is very, very similar and, and we need to find ways to um, leverage and build partnerships, relationships and connections in ways that um, can move us all uh, to the next step. So a little bit closer look at some of those connections between uh, these documents. Um, so both of them talk about what students are doing and what students are doing in, in the NDSS, which sounds like quite a few of you know already, is all about the science and engineering practices. Um, so these are the practices that, that scientists and engineers use and that we want students to be engaged in, in the classroom. And they are things that you see there. They're like, we want them to be asking and asking questions and defining problems, developing using models, planning and carrying out investigations and so on and so forth. Those are what are listed in, in the framework document, and of course, then in the next generation science standards and in, in the guidelines for learning, uh, you have a whole strand that's called questioning analysis and interpretation of skills. And you, what you'll notice there is that there's a, a fair amount of crossover. Um, again, with what are sort of our vision is and what sort of we want to do with these pieces and how we can move things forward. Um, I would sort of also call out though that there are differences and um, there are some really unique things about the NGSS that sort of, even though I was in the, the environmental education space and, and there are a lot of things that are really familiar to me from this space. There are some pieces that are really new and different about these standards that push us and challenge us to move forward. Um, we talk about those as being the NGSS innovations. Um, you can find a more in-depth treatment of these at that short URL on, on the left hand side of the screen. There's a little bitly um, that will direct you to where this document is housed and there's a document that sort of describes each one of these innovations. But just in quick summary, it's about making sense of phenomena and designing solutions to problems. Um, that it's about kids figuring out their world around them. And those things very much fit in well um, with types of things that I tried to do in my classroom. And I think that a lot of environmental educators try to do in, in what they're, what's happening. And then designing solutions to problems, which again, fits in well uh, with, if there's a, environmental situation that you want to try to resolve and you try to set up um, a solution to that problem, those things can potentially be a great fit, a great context um, for the type of learning that we'd love to see around the next generation science standards. One piece that's um, sort of pushes and is new that's, that's not necessarily in sort of some of the strands that were in the guidelines for excellence, um, guidelines for learning, um, is this, this three-dimensional learning and assessment. 
and people identified those dimensions well in the chat. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but they had the disciplinary core ideas or the DCIs, um, some of the science information that um, would sometimes have been called, quote, content. Um, we have the science and engineering practices or the SEPs. We just talked about those a second ago. Those are the practices and uh, that scientists and engineers engage in that we want students to be engaging in in the classroom. And then cross-cutting concepts, which are those lenses or CCCs, the lens that you can use to evaluate and look at materials and, and the world and make those connections um, between, uh, between content areas and, and across the, the discipline of science. The standards are also built into K-12 progressions. So a lot of the really fun, innovative stuff that I did in, in the classroom and at the high school level was sort of outside of and beyond. It was an environmental science elective course that people did after everything else. Um, and sometimes some of the people that I worked with would do environmental science pieces that were add-ons or in addition to or sideline from um, the rest of the science learning that they did. And what this, the NGSS and the framework really try to uh, focus on is how do we make sure that we're building that essential across all three dimensions um, over the K-12 spectrum. Also um, woven in there are engineering design and the nature of science uh, across, across the entire K-12 spectrum. Another innovation of the standards is that they have make explicit connections to English language arts and mathematics uh, so that you have uh, if you're working with elementary educators in particular, um, you've got robust connections across disciplines that are happening in even a different way than have happened in standards before. And last, but probably most important um, here is that this is about all students in the classroom. The reason that we have three dimensions, the reason that we, um, the framework calls for students to be making sense of phenomenon, designing solutions to problems, and you have to build these progressions carefully over time is because that's what's been shown to be most effective for all kids to um, engage them in science to make them um, help them recognize its relevance for their lives and, and position themselves as thinking about it as something that is an endeavor that they want to participate in um, for their personal lives for their professional lives all those sorts of things uh, and so the standards themselves in their development process like uh, there was a, an equity team embedded in each of the content areas that kept their eye on this throughout the process and um, tested out the standards in classrooms as case studies to make sure that they were actually following up um, with the vision of what the, the writers of the framework were intending. Uh, and so it's a, it's a key important thing um, about what these standards are all about. And I think that it's something that resonates well with the community of environmental educators. So this is our why. It's about um, all standards and all students. Um, sometimes in this conversation, uh, you know, as Judy and I were planning for this, we're thinking about, you know, it's, it's not about how does environmental education tweak what they do so that the standards are on the page so that people will use programs. It's also not, you know, next generation science standards trying to impose anything on anything else. But it's how do we work together uh, to be able to move these things forward um, so that there is, so we can actually hope to reach this vision that, that was so eloquently put by many of you in the chat. Um, and I think it's really important to, re to remember that as we go through this process and think about uh, the details, it's super easy to get wrapped up on, in to a particular dimension of the standards or um, the bits and pieces and the parts, um, but to really do the sorts of things that we want to do takes more than just um, instructional materials. It takes more than just uh, doing the dimensions of the standards. It, it's about um, building communities and relationships, and it's about the long game um, in terms of preparing students to do what we hope they're able to do, as many of you talked about, um, with their lives beyond high school. So I'm going to pause right there before I sort of shift to some of the uh, big pieces that um, 
we are going to dig into that are somewhat in response to some of the questions and also just some of the big pieces that we wanted to talk about um, that we think might be relevant to these folks and see if there are any other questions that have popped up. So Matt, um, a couple of people have asked about any funding for field trips, the whole experiential learning part, the EE providers, um, pre and post field trip lesson materials, that connection, if you could talk about that at some point of what's out there and what can help, including is there any support for that? Um, yeah, I can do that a little bit. I mean, a, a lot of my experience with, with that is that a lot of that funding is more local. Um, and then there's there are a lot of pieces that need to fall in place. But one of the things I think in terms of the collaboration point that I do wanna bring up here is that um, my hope and what I tried to work for in Kansas and why I'm now trying to help and support in other places as well is that um, implementation isn't happening in isolation so that uh, what's happening in the formal classroom environment and what's happening in the non-formal or out of school environment um, is not happening in parallel or orthogonal or anything that, that there's actually it's really important in this implementation process to be working together in that planning and just a couple examples of what that might look like just from my experiences um, in Kansas. I know, for example, that there was a uh, A science children's museum uh, in Wichita that uh, Was seeing that that their districts were struggling and to, to, to find time on task, honestly, for uh, science at the elementary level. They worked um, with a variety of different folks and, and found funding and actually went out and for, I believe, three counties the last time I found, the last time I connected with that group, um, they were providing all of the science education. So they actually had um, people who are used to be teachers um, who they worked together to build curriculum and they actually were the elementary teachers in all of these rural districts that weren't having science support otherwise. Um, I think that building of a relationship and partnership between formal and informal is as important as um, making the shifts in the standards because mm -hmm. we can't make, we can't make, we can't realize this vision for kids um, unless we change how we're, how we're working together. I mean, we, most of a fair amount of this work that we ask students to do in the classroom involves um, collaboration and group work and, and um, working together. And we build all these structures and spend time to make that efficient in classrooms. And then we step away from that and we work in isolation because um, it, it's just, it's a thing that we do to sort of like narrow the, the scope of what is possible. And I think it's really important in this context, especially when things are in flux, um, to step in and, and take advantage of those opportunities to build um, partnerships and relationships in new ways and think outside of the box um, in that regard. But I don't have like a list of um, resources that are related to field trips. If other folks that are uh, in the chat have some of those options, or if Judy, if you have ideas about that, um, yep. should, that'd be great. And a number of people are posting, and again, we'll collect all of these and share them, and then maybe one of the next steps can be that we talk about how to, to more formally connect EE and the next generation science standards with resources that help on both ends. Yep. Absolutely. Sounds good. So, speaking of that, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we talked about this. Um, uh, one of the ways I think is a, an obvious connection here too is, um, and, and a lot of the work that I do at Achieve now is around instructional materials and designing instructional materials for NGSS. So one of the ways that we can work together um, is to have some common understandings of um, instructional materials and what it means to really be designed for the NGSS. And Achieve has a couple of tools that can help with this. Um, and, a, and I have a cool little thing that we're gonna talk about later that is an opportunity for folks. Um, but uh, one, of those, one of these tools is called the Equip Rubric for Science. Uh, it is uh, designed to help you evaluate the degree to which materials or a unit um, uh, matches up with the next generation science standards. Uh, and it's been around since shortly after the standards were released. 
uh, and is now in its third version, which has a, a scoring rubric with it. This is for at the unit level, but then there's also uh, a tool called the NGSS Lesson Screener that's built from this. This is for a lesson, sort of smaller scale, and there's a tool for evaluating full instructional materials programs. And I'll give you links to all these things in just a minute. Um, with this rubric, Achieve has set up a science peer review panel. And that group um, is 51 people now from all over the United States that are reviewing and providing feedback on instructional materials units that are submitted to it. And we would love it, for example, if people that are listening to this call that are really trying to intentionally design um, materials for the NGSS would consider submitting their materials. And I'll give you a link for that later. If their materials are free and publicly available, it costs you nothing to get that review. Um, and that review involves uh, three people independently reviewing the materials, like combing through them and um, providing criterion-based evidence um, for, for all the criteria of the rubric, and then coming to a consensus report. Um, if, you, if your materials are of high quality uh, and they are rated that way by the peer review panel, then we post those up and share them. Um, we would love to have more environmental science lessons and units uh, to share with the broader community about um, that are examples of design for NGSS and, and point folks to using those uh, in their classrooms. Uh, we also do, I know that some of the people on, on the call might also develop proprietary materials. So if you develop materials that you sell, we can also review those. We don't have separate funding sources to support that. So um, those are not free reviews, but there's inf I'll give you information if that's something that you're interested in as well. And I will give you links to where both all of these things, you can find them um, on our website here in just a little bit. Um, and then the fourth thing that we hope like pushes and challenges, but also is maybe a little carrot for people to uh, think about submitting materials is those that hit the very highest rating of the equip rubric um, can earn a, a digital badge that follows those materials wherever they go. So if you have instructional materials that uh, are well designed for the NGSS and they are recognized as such by the, the peer review panel, uh, then you can actually get a digital badge that's embedded on your website along with those materials um, to, to verify its quality. And people are already popping in with some of the answers. So thank you, TJ, I just saw that come through. Um, but for those folks that didn't get, there's a shorthand for remembering some of these uh, websites and links to get to. Um, so it's all nextgenerationscience.org and here's your shorthand links to get there. So after .org, if you wanna uh, get to sites, pages that are related to these things, um, you just put a slash equip, and I'll take you to the equip page. If you do um, slash PRP, That'll take you to the peer review panel page, but it'll talk, tell you about the panel and how to submit resources. There's a FAQ there that goes into detail um, about what you can can't submit, when you can submit it, how to submit it, et cetera. Um, if you are interested in reviews of proprietary materials, um, that's a link to the achieve.org website. You just go to achieve.org slash reviews. And if you want more information about the NGSS design uh, badge, uh, you just do a slash badge at the end of nextgenscience.org and that'll redirect you to that page. Also, we'll make sure that um, this, this presentation is available afterwards um, and the recording, recording will obviously be available. So um, we're gonna keep moving in sort of this conversation, but we can type those links into uh, the chat box as needed if people um, didn't catch them in the quick pass by. Another thing that I wanna sort of, this is the, our first announcement of, of this opportunity. Uh, and you're gonna to have to just keep your eyes and ears open for a little bit. We'll make sure that we uh, announce it and hopefully we can send it out to the folks that are part of this call. Um, but we are setting up a uh, equip professional learning that's specifically for folks that are developing environmental education materials. Um, so this, at this professional learning, it's a two day long, two full days. Um, where you'll learn how to use the equip rubric, you'll apply it to materials um, and sort of 
really dig in deeply to what it means for these innovations and what specifically that looks like in materials. So if you're in this space and you're planning to be in this space and you're developing materials, it doesn't have to be somebody who's a commercial or a public developer. Um, it can be uh, as long as you would sort of put yourself in that category, um, you would be eligible. It won't be a huge group of folks that we can support, but uh, there won't be a cost uh, for that equipped professional learning. And right now, sort of a save the date if that's something that you're interested in, and you can hold July 12th and 13th on your calendar for a little bit. Um, and, and right now, at least tentatively, not 100% sure, but it should be, um, it's gonna be in Oakland, California on the 12th and 13th, and you can um, have an opportunity to uh, really dig in and, and learn how to use this rubric and evaluate materials that way, which also then impacts how you think about instruction and, and teaching and learning around the standards as well. So I'm gonna stop right there again and see if, um, uh, if questions have popped up in the chat that are about, other than just where are these resources, um, uh, if, if people have questions about PIP or the PRP or, or things like that. Um, Matt, one quick question is, is that workshop only available in person or can people attend virtually? Um, it is a, an in-person workshop in this case. It's, it's a pretty um, hardcore tw two days um, that I don't think we could, um, at least we don't currently have plans to make available virtually. We'll, yep, we'll yep. It, um, and a lot of people have posted a lot of resources that we'll make available to everyone. Um, and then mixed in with that, there are a number of comments. And I just wanted to mention, as you, as you probably know from Bora, that we're updating the K through 12 guidelines to even more effectively link to the next generation science standards, which is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, the, the connections are obviously there. We're talking about the same research sort of base and about what we know works in the classroom. So it, that's, that's great to, to bring up. I'm glad that that's happening. Oh, and uh, Sarah Johnson just said, if Bora is on the webinar, can she explain how they're being incorporated? Um, <laughs> I don't know if Bora is on or not, but we can fill you in more on that, Sarah, about how, how the, the update of the K through 12 is really taking a look at not just the um, next generation science standards, but also the sustainable development goals and some other things that have happened while those have been out. So there will be more on that. Great. Um, one last question. There have been a couple of questions related to NGSS and urban environmental education, urban education. Is there anything specific related to the urban slant that is just not, you know, that, that you might be able to point to, even though a lot of the materials that have been suggested have a lot of urban in them? Um, I don't know if I've got anything that's specifically that. I mean, I think we definitely like the, a big push. Um, is about making these experiences relevant to kids. And um, I'm not sure I have to go back and look at if any of the units that we've posted up have that specific slant, I'd have to think about it. Um, one of the pages that I didn't directly li link to um, there um, is just, if you do a slash HQ NGSS, it's the ones that um, uh, have been identified by the peer review panel as quality units. and at least two of those 10 units that have been identified are ones that are uh, have an environmental education focus. So there may be some things that are there that are, but I don't know, none of those are like programs that are slanted or in an urban direction. Yeah. Keep going. Good. Okay. Good. Um, just a couple of uh, reflections from, from the work working across organizations and, 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 and certainly folks know this, but I think that the, there's this, intersection between formal and informal that are non-formal inside of school, outside of school that, that can potentially um, lead to us not moving things forward, but getting trapped in sort of stereotypical perceptions of, of other folks. And because I think uh, environmental education sits right across those spaces really well, I think it's a really important thing to, to uh, think about. And, and um, as you're moving forward with building these relationships, it, it, you know, the idea of assuming positive intentions um, about, um, you know, it's, it's easy for folks in the formal space to think 
different things about outside of school space and outside of school space have assumptions about inside of school space. And I think that we're, what we're trying to say here with looking at the intersections and the connections is, hey, we're all moving to the same thing and best practice in, in the classroom and out of the classroom actually looks a whole heck of a lot alike. Um, and uh, let's not compare best practice in one place to poor practice in another place, but make sure that we're uh, assuming that we're all on that same team moving forward. Um, it becomes super easy in that context to uh, become, shift into a deficit mindset and not sort of um, value the strengths um, that, that people bring to that conversation. Um, sort of getting to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, super important to get to know the system to be able to change and move the system. Um, I used to say that um, one of the things I hate the most about working at the State Department of Education was the bureaucracy, um, that I really would be frustrating. But the flip side of that is one of my favorite things in the world to do is to figure out a way to subvert bureaucracy su successfully. And, and to do that, you have to know the system and you have to know the pieces and parts and work the system to make those relationships productive. Um, and then the last part about that is make sure you're solving the right problem. Um, the problem isn't some of those things that we've talked about before, like not getting, uh, doing the standards, like it, the problem is not um, changing people's perspective about environmental education. The problem is, is that vision that we had that we're trying to attain is, is, is we're not there in terms of getting all those students prepared for um, their lives beyond high school. And so what do we do to work together to make that happen? And when you're on that same page and, and thinking about it from that perspective, then I think that a lot of things can move forward. Um, I'm gonna skip that specific reference. Uh, Judy, I know that you wanted to sort of like tie things back and wrap up with some more questions. I have a couple of the pieces from um, other questions that people asked uh, in the lead up that I can address here, or we can do a more broad wrap up at this point. Yep, no, I would um, go ahead and answer um, a few of the questions that have already come in. That would be fantastic. And then we can wrap up. Okay, I'll do this really quick. Um, so one of the things about folks ask that same question about guidance about what does it mean? Is there, is there a place that in the research base that talks about um, working together. And so the first thing I thought of was the guide to implementing uh, next generation science standards, um, which talks specifically in one of its recommendations is that this basically is not just about what happens in the formal classroom, um, but it's about um, working together as a community to move forward. So uh, I think there would be some pieces in there if you're looking for support for making um, claims or arguments uh, that you can find as, as good resources. And um, I think that link has been put in, in, the, in the website already or in the chat, but if it hasn't, it's super easy to find just by Googling the guide for implementing NDSS. Um, other folks asked about communication resources. So maybe you're a professional learning provider and, um, and you're trying to make a, a connection with a principal or you're trying to make a connection with um, teachers to help like really sort of get them started around um, next generation science standards. Um, and if you do the nextgenscience.org slash communicating NGSS, there are resources there around, um, there's a parent guides um, at all different levels. There's a uh, guide for principals and a bunch of other communication resources that can help support that. And then, and the last piece sort of is other folks asked about like support for implementing the standards. And um, if you go to, nextgenscience.org slash implementing NGSS, you will there find things like a district level workbook that includes things like reaching out to communities, but based on the guide for implementing um, NGSS sort of walks you through um, what are the steps to doing implementation. And it's a great place for somebody who's partnering um, with the school district to push and help and think about um, what they should do to implement. So, Lots of different resources. There was a ton of things flowing through the chat. There were great resources to share. That was good to see. Um, and I'm super excited. And again, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope that we uh, found some resources to help people out today. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, one, one last question. How will people know about the Equip Workshop? Can you let us know and we can send it out to the whole group? I would be happy to do that. Um, we'll also put it out through our Twitter uh, and 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 uh, if you sign up for the 
email that, that goes out at nextgenscience.org, um, that'll be there as well. Wow, fantastic. There's so much more. We could have had a seven hour webinar. Um, Kristen is posting a few other things um, that we were talking about the standards, a link to the next, uh, to the K through 12 update, the review guide. Any of you, we'd love to hear what you're thinking on that K through 12 review. Um, and then also a link to the crosswalk between the guidelines right now and the NGSS. And again, all of that will be updated. We'd love your input on that. And I think just from listening to this, the bottom line is that the connections are, are so profound. Good science education is good environmental education. We need each other to support each other. We need to do it as a community, formal, non-formal. And luckily this is happening around the country and actually around the world. And I think that from the EE side, the more that we can get our materials reviewed and posted so that everybody has the resources that really do meet the NGSS guidelines would be fantastic, as well as just making all of our folks aware of all the good stuff. And then and the field of EE also brings things to NGSS, um, the civic engagement part of what we do and some of the other things that I think will just enhance all of the, the learning that's going on. So Matt, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate everything you're doing and we look forward to continuing to work with, with you. And as a final wrap up to everyone, let us know if you have other ideas for webinars in the future. Just remember that we're all gonna be gathering in Spokane in October. Hope that you all can come, including Matt. And uh, just appreciate all the sharing that just went on on this chat. We will share it with all of you. And thanks to Max and Kristen who are capturing all of this and all the interactions. So thank you all so much and Matt, fantastic, thank you.